This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you very much, Mark. That's great. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very delighted to be back here presenting uh, after eight and a half years, I think, after I attended my first plant breeding seminar in the department. So it's been a long time and um, I'm very grateful to all my advisors and um, professors at Cornell. So today I'm going to be talking about genomic selection, the global week program current status, some of the lessons we've learned, and what we hope to do in the future. Just an outline about what I'll be talking today. Um, so, so genomic selection in the framework of an applied plant breeding program. So what do we do here and how does CIMIT's program, uh, what are the different stages in the CIMIT breeding program where we can implement genomic selection, what have we tested so far, the different populations, the different uh, traits, the different nurseries, and um, what are lessons that we have learned from all this testing and the future of genomic selection in the Summit Global Week program. So to begin with, um, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction to genomic selection for um, those of you who are not uh, very familiar. So the first step here that we do is um, prediction models, training and evaluation. So we have lines which have both phenotypes and genotypes, which could be an existing um, panel with uh, diversity. So that is the training population. And we use these lines with phenotypes and genotypes to train prediction models. And we evaluate the accuracy. So what is the correlation between the actual and the real um, trait performance? And that's going to be, and that's what I call as a pre-implementation phase because uh, we at current, uh, we at Summit are currently in the pre-implementation phase where we have not really um, gone ahead and implemented genomic selection, but we have been testing uh, for the past several years in different, uh, for genomic selection for different traits. So that's the pre-implementation phase. And then the next phase is the line development phase where you actually use the genomic estimated breeding values to make crosses, to make selections and advanced generations. So, and then, um, after that, you can also use GS for um, evaluating varieties or testing varieties or sparse testing. So you have some lines and some environments and some lines in the other environments, and you can use genomic predictions to predict the performance in different environments. And the last stage is commercialization. So this is what I would call as um, the cycle of um, genomic selection implementation. And we, what I'm going to be describing today is about a lot about pre-implementation phase and evaluation and what we hope to um, do in the future about using real GBVs for um, selections and making crosses. And I would also like to um, just tell you about if you were assigned the task of um, implementing genomic selection in a large scale breeding program, then these are some of the things that you would like to look at. So the first step is identifying opportunities in the breeding program where we can implement GS. And the next step is evaluating predictions for different stages of the, uh, of, uh, of the breeding program, different populations, different scenarios and traits. And the third step is what I consider very important, evaluating the relative advantage of genomic selection over the current best strategies that could be phenotypic selection or pedigree-based selections or anything else which is, uh, which is currently in use. And then the fourth stage will be implementing GS for traits where we, have a, where we will have a high relative gain. So if there are traits where GS is going to perform much better than the current um, phenotypic or pedigree selections, we just go ahead and use GS for those traits. And the last stage is, again, a very interesting stage because there are lots of um, traits where we find GS to be quite challenging. So what do we do with that is just transforming those challenges into exploring more about the predictabilities of those traits. So here I am um, just showing what we do with GS in the Global Weight Program. Why do we have to go for, why do we have to go for GS in the Global Weight Program? Because phenotyping and selection sometimes can be very laborious, expensive, and time consuming as well. And the pictures here are just pictures taken during my first and last year of PhD when I was at Cornell and we came down here at Summit and we were selecting early generations here. Then that's again, a millions and billions of plants here in the early generations. And the current breeding cycle time for wheat is about five to six years. So the question is, can we shorten that cycle time and quickly deliver varieties to farmers? So by cycle time, I mean here, the time taken from making a cross to, the uh, to when 
you recycle that particular line as a parent. So that's about five to six years now. And can we use predictions to skip some years and just quickly advance generations? That's a question we have in the Global Week program. And um, we've been testing genomic selection uh, in different cases to answer this question. And I'm just gonna show you here the, um, the stages where Havage had potential for using GS in the Global Week program. So the first stage here is making parental selection. Here we can use the genomic estimated breeding values to select parents, which is currently done just using the phenotype values, which sometimes can be an ineffective predictor of the real breeding value of a parent. And the next stages are, as you can see here, is GS for early generation within family selections. So this is a stage where we would expect genomic selection to have a very high advantage because you have lots of sister lines and lots of um, Mendelian sampling here. Your pedigree cannot select the best lines from these generations. And so this is a very ideal stage for GS. But the problem we have here at Summit is that there are about um, 0.4 million plants in the F1 generation, 2 million in the F2, and as we go down to the head rows, again, you still have about 150 lines that are maintained as uh, head rows. So that's still a lot, lot of lines for genotyping considering the logistics, um, sampling tissues, and you just go to every single plant and sample it, that's gonna be too huge. And then you have, the if the cost of genotyping is $10 per sample, it's again gonna cost us several million dollars for just genotyping. So we're currently not testing genomic selection in these stages. And again, there's also high heterozygosity in these generations. And um, another key thing to consider would be the cost benefit ratio. So uh, we hear from a lead breeder here at Summit, Dr. Ravi, that the cost of line fixation in Mexico is about $5.7. So comparing that to uh, the genotyping cost of $10 per sample, that's not gonna have a very high cost benefit ratio. So we haven't currently implemented GS or tested GS in these early generations. And the next stage is a head row stage or the pre-yield testing stage. Again, these are 70,000 head rows selected from the previous 15,000 head rows. And we have, uh, again, this would give us a cost of $700,000 for genotyping all these lines. So we've just currently used the pedigree and high throughput phenotyping for predictions at this stage. And the next stage is a first stage of yield testing, which is a very um, feasible stage to test genomic selection because we have more than 9,000 lines here and um, we evaluate grain yield and stem rust in this generation. And the last uh, stage is the second stage of yield testing where we have about 1,000 lines and we test grain yield in six environments, um, including optimum irrigation, heat and drug stress environments, and we have data for a large number of other traits as well, such as agronomic traits, disease resistance, and end use quality. So this is a stage where we um, are currently, these are two stages are where we are currently testing genomic selection. And uh, it's part of the delivering genetic gain and weed project that's managed by Cornell and the USAID Feed the Future projects, a large panel of more than 70,000 weed breeding lines from the stage one yield testing trials have been genotyped from 2013 for seven years now. So that's a huge um, number of lines genotyped and uh, each of them have, about, have more than 94,000 GBS markers in them. So that's a huge data set for us to evaluate genomic selection. And um, I'm just gonna show you some of the results that we have, just go ahead. Um, what happens when we try to predict these traits, especially in the lines that are in the stage two of yield testing. So these are thousand lines. And the top part of this graph shows the prediction accuracies within populations. So that's fivefold, just using cross validations. And the bottom graph shows us predicting lines across populations. So here we're using about 3000 lines from historic training populations to predict about thousand lines in a given um, new set of uh, stage two yield trial lines. And um, if we see on the x-axis and the, we have the traits in the beginning, I have the traits, uh, I have quality traits. So we have alveograph, flower and grain uh, traits. And then in, uh, we have the grain yield traits in different environments. So we have grain yield in five irrigations, two irrigations, drought, heat stress environments. And then we have heading, maturity, septoria, spot lodge, stem rust, and stripe rust. So 
this is almost a, a whole range of trades that Summit evaluates in the second stage of yield testing. So we have evaluated GS for all these trades. And as you can see, let's just move on to the first, um, to the top part of the graph here. And we can see most trades have a prediction accuracy greater than 0.5, which is very good. And the best predicted trade was green color. And that's very, um, very obvious and expected because it's a very simple trade, um, very oligogenic trade. Again, if you look at the bottom part of the graph, you can see most trades still have a decent prediction accuracy comparable to within population predictions. But then you can see grain yield. You can see the dip in grain yield related trades here because uh, most of them go down to 0.2 when you try to predict across years. But still, you can see quality trades are well predicted. And then STEMRAS, again, which has a predictability of 0.6, is well predicted. So that's our uh, lesson from um, these uh, prediction exercises. So grain yield is very challenging to predict across years, but then trades like quality, um, which are some of the trades like flour protein and grain protein are still complex, but still you can predict them because you do not have that huge environmental component for those trades as much as grain yield does. So another question was, um, is this because uh, are we seeing poor prediction accuracies for grain yield across nurseries just because we have uh, we're using poor markers? So what we did is this interesting experiment where we had 77,000 markers which were unfiltered and then we had filtered for 70%, 50% and 10% missing data. So we have 15,000, 9,000 and 2,000 markers after we filtered. And then as you can see the trend here, which is very interesting again, the more stringent you are in filtering for missing data, you tend to get markers that are highly clustered towards the telomeric ends, and there's lots of gaps in the centromeric and pericentromeric regions. So we have these different sets of markers in addition to few other markers, so marker sets. So for example, from the 10 person missing data, as you can see in this figure, I further filtered them for high pairwise correlations of 0 0.8, 0 0.5, and 0 0.3, resulting in marker data sets of 1,500 and 160. And then we did genomic predictions using uh, these different marker sets, both within and across populations. And we have the same, uh, a lot of traits in the x-axis. And as you can see from this figure, most of the prediction accuracies are not very significantly different from each other, except when you go down to 160 uh, line, uh, markers. So you can see that the green uh, line here, which is about 500 markers, is still giving us a decent prediction accuracy as much as um, 16,000 markers. And just to mention, all these are imputed markers. So that's, agree that's an agreement with what is observed in most other crop species as well. It doesn't mean that the more number of markers you have, the better prediction accuracies we get. But um, for a crop like wheat, where there's high LD, about a 500 to 1,000 markers are still good enough to give you you um, good prediction accuracies. So moving on, um, so I'm going to be talking about grain yield, genomic selection from grain yield, which I'm currently focusing highly. So um, let's just move and talk about what the current yield testing scheme at CIMIT is and how we have tested genomic selection in these different stages. So the first uh, stage of yield testing where we have more than 6,000 lines is just evaluated in one irrigated environment. And the second stage of yield testing, where we have 1,000 lines, we evaluate the lines in six different environments. That includes drought stress and heat stress environments. The third stage, we only have 280 lines, where um, the lines are evaluated in just one drought, one heat stress, and one optimum environment. And then some of these lines, about 500 lines, the third stage go to South Asia for evaluation in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And then we have the International Yield Trial Nurseries, which are about 50 lines and are distributed globally to more than 100 countries. So moving on to the accuracies that we have from these different stages of yield testing. So I'm just showing you here the number of lines in the training population and the number of lines in the testing population in these different stages. So the first stage we have, since we have about 9,000 lines for cross validations, we have about 7,000 lines and 100 and 800 lines in the val validation population. And then the second stage, we have about 870 lines of training population and 200 in the validation population. And at the third stage, we have 224 lines of training population and 56 lines of validation population. So 
um, the question here is, can we just test a few of these lines and predict others? Or can we minimize replications within years uh, by using predicted values? And the accuracies we have, as you can see on the right, the first stage, we have about 0.56, which is a good prediction accuracy. And then for the remaining stages in stage two, we have about 0.5 average. And then in stage three, we still have um, lower prediction accuracies of 0.4 because these are now very few lines which are very highly selected for grain yield. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning, our, the best part is to compare prediction accuracies with baseline prediction accuracies. So across all these stages, we compared genomic relationship-based predictions to pedigree relationship-based predictions. And as we can see in the figure in the bottom panel, across all these different stages, so this is a mean of four different cycles, and you can see genomic prediction accuracies perform very similar to the pedigree-based prediction accuracies. And we also ask the same question. So what happens if we test a few lines and predict others? And now we ask this question for our target environments in Asia because there was a question if we could predict lines in India or Pakistan or not countries using um, genetic selection, it's just using genomic relationships. So uh, what I'm showing here, uh, here are the number of lines in um, the training population. So we have about 430 lines and about 100 lines of validation population in this particular yield trial grown in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, the South Asia red wheat trial. And then we have the elite spring wheat trials where we just have 22 lines um, in the training and 22 in the validation because this is just in Australia about 45 uh, lines with a few checks, um, making it 50 lines. And, and I very much understand that um, this is a very small population. and It's not very good for testing genomic predictions, but we're just doing it to see what happens when we um, use these small nurseries as well. And in the bottom figure, I, uh, what we see here is um, the prediction uh, the prediction accuracies in Obregon, as you can see uh, in the first um, few um, prediction accuracies are all from Obregon, followed by the South Asia bred wheat trial prediction accuracies, and then we have the accuracies from um, India and Pakistan. And as you can see very clearly here that Obregon prediction accuracies are usually higher. And then in South Asia bred wheat trials, you see about 0.5 because now you're having a smaller population size. And again, when you go down to the SWITs, which are the elite spring wheat yield trials, you see again, huge variability. So the standard deviations here are also very high. Uh, this is just a, across two years and you can see one year is very well predicted and the other year is not predicted well at all. So that's very high standard deviation across years in the international nurseries. So the general conclusion, so I have given you a picture of all the yield testing stages of CIMED. So right from the first three stages at Obregon to the international stages, we see the same trend that genomic predictions did not have a high um, predictability or pedigree based predictions. So the question is why is, why are we not um, able to predict them or and, and let's look just look at one more case here when we try to predict the grain yield of new lines and new environments so what i've showed you before are just cross validations within years and environments and here we have the prediction accuracies across years and environments and this is just considering thousand lines predicted across years from three thousand lines from historic training sets and as you can see the prediction accuracies from genomic and pedigree relationships very well expected genomics will have a slight increase in pedigree over the pedigree relationships across years because you do not have too many full SIBs or half SIBs across years. They're very different populations. So we do have a slight advantage of using genomic relationships across years. But one thing to note here is prediction across years itself, the mean is gonna be about 0.3. So you can get a marginal increase of 0.07 to 0.15, which is, again, not very high for grain yield. And so predictions across years for grain yields are still very challenging. So this, all of this made us ask a question. So what are the full set family sizes in CIMED's yield testing stages? So in this figure, I'm gonna show you the full set family sizes on the x-axis. So it's a family size of one, two, three. And in stage one, the maximum family size we have is 65. So we have 65 full sets, which is the biggest family in considering um, three years of stage one yield trials. And then in stage two, the biggest size was 44 sister lines per family in stage three. It went further down 11 full sips per family stage. In South Asia trials, only 18. And in the 
final nursery that CIMED distributes globally is just one, two, or three full sets per family. So this is a key consideration here. So genomic predictions will work better than pedigree when we have a sufficient Mendelian sampling variance. But the nurseries that we are dealing with at CIMED, there's no scope to outperform pedigree-based predictions because the family sizes are very small. And the next um, question we also had was, how similar are genomic relationships to pedigree relationships? And this uh, figure shows us the pedigree relationships in a thousand lines plotted against the genomic relationships. And as we can see, there are, there's a good trend. The relationships are quite similar, but there are some cases where you will have a very low pedigree relationship and a high genomic relationship. And we can see the range in relationships between these two um, matrices. So there are some differences between genomic and pedigree relationships, but still, uh, because of the small family sizes, genomic predictions perform um, as good as pedigree predictions in our yield testing stages. The next question we had is what about grain yield predictions in full set families? Because this is where we would expect GS to have a very good advantage. So as you can see in this figure here, I have taken 10 different full set families from stage one of yield testing and the number of lines or sister lines in each of these families is given by N here. So you have about 40, you have 64 lines. You have, um, and then I've also mentioned the accuracies of prediction within these full set families in stage one of yield testing. So as you can see, the accuracies in some families are 0.05 and the accuracies in another family goes up to 0.52. So these are full set grain yield predictions. And one interesting thing we have noted here is, so on x-axis, what we have are the scale correlations between full sips estimated from their genetic covariances. So this is a relationship, essentially the relationships among the full sips. And on the y-axis, we have the grain yield differences between the full sips. And if we were to have a hypothesis here, the hypothesis was the highly related full sips will have a very small grain yield difference between them. So if you have a 0.8 relationship, then you're going to have a very small grain yield difference. And then if you have a very different, um, if, you, if you are very different from your full set, then you're going to have a large difference in grain yield. So that was a hypothesis here. And it did well. And to some extent, we saw a relationship between the full sets and grain yield. But what is very interesting here are these relationships between 0.1 and 0.4 where you can see a whole range in the grain yield uh, between the full sips, but they have a very similar relationship. So a line with a 0.2 relationship can have a grain yield uh, difference of zero to a grain yield difference of two, uh, two tons. So that's very uh, interesting here. So maybe the full sips are sometimes not highly related. And uh, even if they are related, it doesn't mean that they have very similar grain yields. So that was a lesson that we learned uh, from um, doing this analysis. And we also looked at the full sets. How different are they genomically? And in this figure, you can see one full set family, and it's just the red and green just illustrate uh, alternate allele and the, and the other allele. Uh, and then you can see in different chromosomes, you can see still in the field trial stage, you have 2000 markers segregating, and genomically, they're not very similar. So there's full sets, even in the stage of yield testing, which is F8, F9s can have a lot of dissimilarities and all of them have been selected to be phenotypically very similar agronomically, but then um, they can be very different genomically. So that's our lesson learned from these full sets. So we have to test everything by just not using our breeding population. So we had a separate biparental population, about a 200 full sets from uh, this cross, and then we tested leaf rust, stem rust, stripe rust differences, and we also looked at prediction accuracies for these different um, uh, uh, traits. And as you can see, for all these differences with prediction accuracies, it was shown in orange here, a range between 0.4 and 0.65. And, but then again, you can see there's a lot of, there's a range of differences uh, for sister lines that might have very similar relationships among themselves. So this is a, this seems to be a very uh, interesting and um, key consideration when we try to use genomic selection for uh, family selections. Next question we had was if we could use genomic selection and skip a year of yield testing in Obregon. So what I'm showing you here are um, predictions between stage one and stage two where there are thousand common lines 
and between stage one and three, where there are 280 common lines, and stages between stages two and three, where there are again 280 uh, common lines. And on the x-axis, we have the different environments, and the red bars here indicate the genetic correlation across stages. The green bar shows a phenotypic correlation across stages, and the yellow bar shows the prediction accuracy from a baseline model with just environment and line effects, while the um, blue bar shows the prediction accuracies from a G by E model. And it's very, it was very clear to us that the prediction accuracies across years highly depends on the phenotypic correlation across years. No matter how high your genetic correlation is, you still have that environment effect. So the phenotypic correlation should be uh, giving you a good picture of the predictabilities across years. And then there was no difference between just using an environmental by line model versus using a G by E model. This is just prediction of the same lines in another year. And that's because uh, so we try to find out, so what's the reason? Why do we have high, um, why do we have similar accuracies using the baseline model and the G by E model? And in this figure, you can see that the year-to-year -year phenotypic correlations in Obregon is ranges between 0.3 to 0.47. So some, um, it's just the year effect, which is so huge. And when we try to look at the variance confidence of year effect, and the environment or the error effect, we see that the year effect is sometimes six times much as the G by E effect. That's why G by E models are useful, but then they might not give us a very high uh, prediction over the baseline models. And um, the next question we had is, what, what is happening between these trials and Obregon? So we looked at the trial to trial grain yield variation, and for this is for two checks, Bodlog 100 and Kachu, and these were evaluated in 355 trials in Obrick on the stage one appeal testing. And as you can see, the figure, the top panel, you have one check, Bodlog, and at the bottom panel, we have another check, Kachu, and you can see two replications, and the range in variation just for these checks can be up to four times. And at least a minimum of two times between them in the different trials. So grain yields, in, even in different trials within the same environment, you can have a huge range just because of the soil factors and other environmental, micro, environmental conditions in that particular trial. So it's not very feasible to just predict grain yield using, um, uh, using uh, genomic predictions. And we also ask the question, if this is the case, are we just breeding for the environment or also or are we also breeding uh, looking at is there a significant improvement in the genetics of grain yield across years so as you can see in this figure we looked at um, about 40 different markers which were associated with grain yield in different studies and we've looked at the increase in the number of the these uh, different favorable alleles for these different markers across years and if you see from 2014 to this in cycle 2018-19, you can see there was a very clear increase in the number of grain yield favorable alleles across years. So there is an increase. Uh, there, there's something that is increasing genetically, but then most of these markers were associated with large effect grain yield low side. So there is a predictable portion of grain yield which has a large effect. And then there are also very small effect markers that are not well um, uh, whose effects cannot be that estimated across the years. And we also profiled our crossing blocks to see if they have a high proportion of grain yield favorable alleles. And it seems, and this is again, the same 40 markers on the x-axis, and you can see some of the very best lines, the crossing blocks, a green, um, bar, green square here just shows us it's having a favorable allele for grain yield. And it's it was very much consistent with what, um, but because most of the high um, yielding lines had a lot of, uh, favorable alleles. So there is a very good genetics behind um, the lines of the crossing blocks as well, but still predictability of grain yields is not very simple. And that is because, maybe because of this, the, uh, the next thing that we observed here is if we plot the number of favorable alleles for grain yield on the x-axis versus the grain yield on the y-axis, as you can see, lines that have very few grain yield alleles tend to have a lower yield, and lines with a lot of grain yield alleles tend to have a higher yield. So that's very clear from this figure. But what is difficult to predict are these mediocre lines in between where you have a very average yield, but then some of these lines can also have a huge variation 
in grain yield. So this, this figure is beautifully showing us that the genetic component behind grain yield predictions is strong, but then what is quite unpredictable are these variations. Some lines can have very few QTL and have a very high yield, and some lines can have a lot of QTL and have still have the low um, mean yields. So that's where we struggle to predict grain yield. And then we also compare genomic predictions with phenotypic selections. And then if you see this figure, what I'm showing you here are the lines which were not selected. If you just select 50% of lines using both GEBVs and phenotypic um, grain yield values, you can see a lot of lines were not selected by genomic selection and phenotypic selection. So that's very good, which we can use for discarding the lines because several lines are just rejected by using both these methods. And the green dots here show the lines that are selected by both genomic selection and phenotypic selection. And you can see out of the 900 top lines that were selected, 33% of the lines were selected by both these methods, which is again good because you're still having a good correlation between predicted and observed values. And then you can see the blue dots here, which show the lines that were selected by phenotypic selection, but um, not by genomic selection, which is about two thirds of the lines. So that's where some breeders are really hesitant to just use GEBVs because you might be missing two thirds of the top lines. There's a risk there if you just don't phenotype and just rely only on genomic breeding values. So we also did the same um, experiment for stem rust. And this is just showing four different cycles. And for stem rust, again, it's much more um, nicer compared to grain yield because you can see about uh, 82, 85 percent of the lines were discarded by both genomic selection and phenotypic selection. But again, you only have out of the 10 percent top lines selected, you have 50 percent of them selected by genomic selection and phenotypic selection. And a few lines are still good stem rust, have good stem rust resistance, but you still were not able to predict them. And what we've done here. Um, the last few slides I'll be talking about is how we have used genomic selection for quality. As I've showed you in the beginning, quality is very well predicted from historic training populations. And what I'm showing you here, uh, the prediction accuracy is obtained from using historic training populations to predict the stage one nurseries, about 8,000 lines, which, were, which are usually not evaluated for quality because they have the high cost. The cost of um, quality evaluation for one sample is going to be about $61. So usually these 9,000 lines do not get evaluated for quality. So what if we just use historic training populations and predict quality? And then you can see the accuracies are very good. So you can see for alveograph, you still have a 0.6 accuracy if you try to scale up selections to earlier generations by using genomic predictions. And it's again going to be a huge cost savings, especially if you are you, if, if the cost of phenotyping is $61 per sample, it's going to be a huge cost savings for programs. So there are some cases where genomic selection is going to be very useful, but grain yield is going to be a very challenging trade as our observation. And one more key thing as breeders, um, we have to remember that breeding is not about um, single traits. So this figure on the left shows us the correlations between different traits that are evaluated in the second stage at summit. So you can see some traits have a very highly negative correlation with each other. So if you're trying to simultaneously improve multiple traits, then uh, it's going to be very challenging um, for some, uh, for predicting some traits. And um, the last two slides, I'm just going to show what we plan to do on, in the future with, um, with the results that we currently have. And, what we, from, and from what we've learned. So uh, in the parent selection stage where we have not used genomic selection so far, so we're gonna be complementing phenotypic selection with uh, GBVs as well in the parent selection stage, and then evaluate some cheaper marker platforms because as I mentioned, the current cost of genotyping is about $10. So it's not feasible to implement genomic selection for millions of lines in these early generations. So what if we try other cheaper marker platforms um, for predicting in the early generations. And then um, as we are continuing to use pedigree and high throughput phenotyping for a head row stage, and then in the yield trial stage, as I mentioned, we can scale up selections to previous generations um, by using genomic selection. And this is the last slide I had where I'm gonna show you what we plan to do, a very tentative proposed breeding scheme for the future. So now we have a very clear impression that 
in the yield, select, yield testing stages, genomic selection might not give us a very high advantage over the pedigree. So the best thing to do is to do um, early rapid generation advancements. So as part of a new advancing, uh, sorry, accelerating genetic gain in maize and wheat projects by the Gates Foundation, we're gonna test this hypothesis where if, of, um, if we would see, if we could rapidly advance um, generations earlier. So we have a field screen house in Toluca that's currently being constructed. And so we're gonna be advancing all these generations in early generations of field screen house and not putting them out in the field and then in the F6, again, go for selecting just based on genomic estimated breeding values and not um, based on yield testing. So if we could do that in the first stage of yield testing, and then um, again, this is gonna be based on very few, this is a pilot and it's gonna be based on very few uh, crosses with a higher number of uh, sister lines per cross. And by all of this, we're just gonna to try to see if we could uh, shorten the breeding cycle to four years versus um, uh, using five to six years. And um, with that, that's all I had for today. And um, um, this is a very collaborative work from um, Summit and Jesse Poland at Kansas State. And I would also like to um, thank, very specially thank Mark Soros, um, Gary Brookstrom, Ronnie Kaufman, all my advisors at Cornell uh, for teaching me plant breeding that I could now use um, and testing all these things down here at Summit. Thank you very much. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.